Chapter 15 High Council President Howard, do you know why this meeting of the High Council was called? asked Xi Jinping, the leader of Communist China, while looking around the large room containing all 32 halfling leaders. Not sure, Xi, but these humans are very suspicious of strange occurrences, and this many world leaders vanishing at once will send them into a frenzy if discovered, Howard, the President of the United States, replied. Don't worry, boys. This climate change conference cover is just what we needed for such a gathering. The humans think it is a good thing we all come together for one goal, blah, blah, blah. I just cannot stand these Hoganlow bodies. How was our race ever so disgusting? Elizabeth, the Prime Minister of England, added. We do feel the same, Elizabeth. But at one point, these Hoganlow did serve a purpose. Had it not been for their creation and the battles they fought, we may have destroyed the entire galaxy. Xi Jinping interceded on behalf of the humans. Oh, Xi Jinping, I remember your thoughts on subjects of the Hogan Lo from our time in the Source. In fact, everyone that had their flesh eaten by those beasts remember your loving thoughts of them and could not wait to get into a new body just to be separated from you once again. I even took position as a halfling, knowing I would end up in a lost Source crystal that may never be recovered. Elizabeth held nothing back when on the ancient science station, humans called the moon. Having been one of the last scientists to use the facilities 12,000 years ago, mention of that simple label humans used to describe such a magnificent creation caused her human emotion of anger to overtake her. We must enter the Grand Chamber. Unlike the Hogan Low back on Earth, we can't be late for counsel. Howard addressed the others in a calm monotone, missing the days when he was pure Norcox. Each agreed without saying a word and began walking toward the tall, heavily engraved dual doors of the Grand Chamber. With all 32 halflings seated, the council entered from each side of the room through doors that were also much taller than needed, but were intended to show respect for those entering. No Norcox thought anything of their size till they were placed in human bodies, causing them to tower over others of their race. With all the lower council members present, Bakla descended from above on his glowing disc, stopping a few feet above the round table where the fourteen council members stood. Bakla, the High Council of the Norcox, identified by a golden electronic crown, conducted meetings and possessed final say of all matters not resolved by the lower fourteen gathered members. Without the aid of any noticeable devices, Bakla's voice filled the chamber for each to easily hear. The Council has been called to address some important matters. You, as volunteers, know what is asked to keep control of the Hoganlos. We, as Norcox, can no longer descend to the surface of Earth in our current state of being. Therefore, we must have a consciousness consent to alteration in the Great Source for placement inside a Hoganlos vessel. This is how the process has gone since our return, but now I need to report that Due to the rigorous changes one must go through, we currently have no further volunteers. With Bakla's opening announcement, a slight murmur echoed through the chamber. What does that mean for us? One of the halflings shouted, displaying more of its human half than its Norcox in that moment. With that question, the room suddenly fell silent. Bakla raised his disc higher above the council table to get the attention of those around him before speaking. As we all know, tragedy suffered by this solar system was directed by we who are not there. We who are not there, a reference to their future selves. We who are not there sent this warning seconds before enacting their plan for Hoganlow termination. Before I answer your question, Kim, allow me to play that message. Bakla nodded to the halfling put in control of North Korea. With what appeared as a few strokes to the air in front of him, Bakla activated a large holographic screen near the center of the chamber. Even with everyone seated in a circular pattern, each saw the screen as facing them while the message played. I am Voss, the High Chair of the Norcox Alliance. Actions taken are for the survival of our race and to prevent destruction of the Alliance by the Hogan Low. Those on the worlds we have destroyed only brought wars due to the addictive nature of not just their insulin and proteins, but other chemicals derived from these abominations. 
worlds became aggressive and began conquest of other peaceful civilizations due to these enzymes. So it has been determined that the humans must never be allowed to survive. Please note, that was the point signal was lost as the space lab otherwise known as the moon was struck by a large solar flare created by the pulsar. It was obvious to the Norcox there was an error in calculation when the message was sent followed so close by with a pulsar striking. After extensive study, they believed the largest error had to be with the amount of solar radiation released, something made evident as the Norcox on Earth died and all the others becoming ill before quickly leaving the solar system and abandoning many source crystals on Earth. Turning on his glowing disk to face Kim's direction, Bakla answered, A search is now underway to retrieve the Hogan Low source and our binding source crystals lost during the destruction by we who are not there. After this has been completed, the Hogan Low will no longer be a threat to the galaxy. Your mission will have been accomplished, Kim. Unlike discussions of councils filled with Hogan Low representatives, there were no hidden meanings when the Norcox Council spoke. Where do we stand on their discovery? Elizabeth asked in a smooth, steady voice. Balka turned his disc slightly to face her direction, before speaking to ensure her that he showed each volunteer respect. As most of you are aware, we sent another group of Hoganlow to investigate a possible area. What you may not be aware of is that four of them were taken control of by programmers, or Simons, resulting in their deaths. All programmers have been accounted for on this station. Logic says they must be controlled by others. Find out who and report. There has been an increasing number of Zoetarian trioptic craft harvesting around the planet. We should focus on them for now. They have the most to lose when these Hogan Low are eliminated, Howard stated. So, we are just going to waste all the benefits derived from the humans? President Arneson of South Africa asked a little aggressively, catching the attention of those in the chamber. They dismissed his actions as part of his Hoganlow persona. Lowering himself to inches above the council table, Bakla listened to the discussions of the 14 members regarding the question presented. Each member looked to Bakla as they spoke to show respect for the high chair and prevent any others from feeling disrespected. Minutes passed as one member spoke then the next. Not till each lower council had spoken did Bakla once again rise above the table to address the halflings. In regards to the Zoetarians, monitor and do not impede. In regards to the question asked of the Council on Destruction of Hoganlos to ensure their complacency, there will be an increase in distribution of barium and lithium into the planet's ionosphere. Once the source has been retrieved, we will then activate programming and send all for processing of rare proteins and insulin. As a contingency plan, we hold battle cruisers programmed for immediate elimination if sprays become ineffective. No attack on a Norcox will be tolerated. With the Council's decision, a smile spread across Arneson's face. Once Bakla finished speaking, the disc he stood upon rose slightly while each lower Council member and the 32 halflings watched till Bakla's disc merged with the ceiling and its glow was no more. At this point, everyone knew all discussions were concluded. Soon, the lower council members retreated in the reverse manner in which they had opened. You know, since I have been in this human bio-platform, I have begun to really disliking this process. Oh, shut up, Arneson. It is you, isn't it? You're the one stopping the Hoganlow from finding the source, Elizabeth snapped. Arneson's face tightened up, causing endless wrinkles to rise from the corners of his eyes before he spoke in a powerful voice with a hint of aggression. I believe you forget your place and who you are, Elizabeth. We are Norcox, and though we may not provide all information at times, we do not lie and plot against our own kind. Breaking out in laughter as they exited the great chamber, everyone focused on her just as the laughter was cut off and she stared into Arneson's eyes. You're a Zymer. I can see it in your eyes. You don't want anyone to find the source because you are using. Don't be absurd. I want off this planet the same as you. You think I want this body to die here and get stuck with a lost source, or, worse, the human's source for all of time? No. Now if you will excuse me, I must be getting back. With that, Arneson exited with all eyes scrutinizing his every move. He is right about one thing, Elizabeth stated, 
then waited for someone to show interest in what she had to say. What is that? Xi Jinping asked, giving her the attention she desired. None of us want to be joined with either of the source crystals. I do wonder, however, why he insists on calling them humans when among his own kind, she asked, keeping the thought of Arneson's possible deceit alive. Growing tired of listening to this topic, Howard tried moving the conversation to something more productive. How are we going to increase our spraying of barium and everything else? These Hoganlow are already heavily questioning what they are calling chemtrails. My dear Howard, what does it matter? Soon as we have the source, all of this will be nothing but a memory, and we will be reunited with those we have lost. Elizabeth thought about her companion she had not seen since the pulsar struck Earth, creating a catastrophic reaction on its surface. Hinsa was the only reason she had volunteered for the mission to Earth, having lost him there 12,000 years ago. On more than one occasion, Elizabeth found the loss of Hinsa to be unbearable, giving up new life visuals to remain in the source where concept of time passed quicker, with thousands of years feeling more like a month. They discussed the possibility of their mission coming to an end while making their way to the vortices. Each had new ideas on how to achieve their goal sooner, but all topics always seemed to come back to why someone was trying to stop them and who was using the programmers. Where do you think someone acquired them? Elizabeth asked as she and Howard entered the hallway marked with a seven above it. They were heading to Earth, where meetings were already in progress, so the conversation continued. I really cannot see how they would have survived on the planet after the Pulsar or over the many millenniums since. They almost had to have come from here no matter what the records indicate. I still think Arneson has something to do with it. Well, if he does, we have plenty of resources to find out. Hey, I was also thinking we should increase the number of troops in the Middle East. It will increase our chances of someone finding the source or at least providing leads to one if the Afghanistan mission turns up nothing. I'll be sending another team to investigate that one soon, Howard added, knowing she was not going to have any issues with his idea. By the time Howard had finished speaking, they had walked from the moon station down the hall to the exit near the Algerian megalith, where their planes awaited. Yes, sounds good. The sooner we find them, the better. Also, I suggest getting those fools in the CIA moving. If we don't have anyone to fight in the Middle East, then there will be no need for increasing the troops. Sometimes I think they had more of their consciousness removed than half. Elizabeth laughed. Will do. See you back in London for our meeting. Howard called loudly to Elizabeth as she began walking up the stairs to her plane. Elizabeth simply waved with the back of her hand without turning around or slowing her climb up the stairs. Relieved to have the day over in time to herself, she signaled to Jared, her assistant, that she was ready for takeoff and made her way back to her office. Just before closing the door, she glanced back, spotting Jared walking her way, but with a raise of one finger before the door shut, he stopped. Now in the one place she knew nobody would bother her or interrupt, she took a seat behind her desk sitting with perfect posture with both arms resting on the chair as her fingers curled over the end, staring forward motionless. After a few seconds, she reached over with her right hand and opened a secret compartment molded perfectly into the corner of the desk. As it opened, a long, white, pencil-sized device appeared with a metallic cube just below it. Calmly removing the two objects, Elizabeth placed the pencil-sized object to the cube, and as they met, Little lights appeared down the side with multiple geometric shapes and symbols. After pressing once on each of the objects, she heard a light hissing sound. A smile stretched across her face in anticipation. With the long white cylinder charged, she placed the metallic cube back in its hidden compartment. She slowly brought the tip of the long device up to her nostril and slid it in till it stopped. With the device now in the position she desired, she pressed another symbol, causing it to hiss once again. This time, her eyes squinted tightly as her body began to vibrate as sadistic smile crept across her face.